Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to A Song of Ice and Fire. In this series, we are seeking to explain the link that exists between the gods and magic. As we all know, old powers are waking. And in our last released video in this series, we introduced you to Garth Greenhand, the once High King of the First Men and progenitor of many of the great families from the Reach and beyond. Garth and his children reigned supreme throughout the Dawn Age, which came to an end when the Children of the Forest and the First Men signed the Pact. As we've stated in previous videos, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. And so too was the case when the Dawn Age drew to a close. Coming up in this video, we are going to be discussing the Age of Heroes, and more specifically, one of the most legendary heroes and descendants of Garth Greenhand, Brandon the Builder, including his parentage, his involvement in the construction of some of the most noteworthy structures in all of Westeros, and the role he played in ending the first long night. So, let's do this. As stated in our previous video, we believe that Rose of Red Lake and Brandon of the Bloody Blade are Bran the Builder's parents. Now, before we delve into the who's, what's, where's, and why's of this, we wanted to briefly point out that until Brandon of the Bloody Blade showed up, she was Rose of Blue Lake. Blue Roses, anyone? From reading the legends of Garth's children, it appears that his magic passed more fluidly down his female line of descendants than the male lines, as his legendary sons were mostly renowned warriors, whereas Rowan Goldtree grew a magical golden tree, Ellen Eversweet had some sort of magical tie to the bees, and Rose was a skin changer and a shapeshifter who could literally transform into a crane at will. Based on this, it seems likely that it was through her that Bran the Builder inherited his magical abilities, as there is no mention of Brandon of the Bloody Blade possessing magic. His legend was built on being a renowned warrior. It is also said that Rose's magical abilities are found in the girls of House Crane, which may add another layer to the reasons the Faceless Men really wanted Arya. She's not only a powerful skin changer, but is capable of completely transforming into another person, in height, weight, voice, and seemingly everything, which is likely an ability that the Faceless Men would seek in a new recruit, and an ability that she likely possesses due to the fact that she is a female descendant of Rose. So, since we don't have many direct references to the beautiful Rose of Red Lake, Let's do some digging outside of the books to see if we can find out what may have inspired George's decision to name her Rose. As we've mentioned, George painstakingly chooses the names for his characters, as the name is somehow representative of who the character is. So in this case, the name Rose first gained popularity among medieval Christians, as roses were associated with the Virgin Mary, and were seen as a symbol of love and beauty. The first person born in the Americas to be canonized was Saint Rose of Lima, whose skull sits surmounted with a crown of roses at the Basilica in Lima, Peru. So taking these two ideas into consideration, this brings to mind the most infamous female Stark in our story, Liana who wore a crown of blue roses when she was crowned the Queen of Love and Beauty at the tourney at Harrenhal. In the 19th century, the name Rose regained popularity and many believe was derived from the Latin form Rosa, with the flower in mind. 
Roses have long been a symbol of love and passion, as the ancient Greeks and Romans associated roses with Aphrodite and Venus, their goddesses of love. Roses appear in accounts from all of the world's major religions as a symbol of miraculous love at work in the world. In alchemical texts and art, the placement, color, and state of bloom of the rose carries a subtle message. For instance, a rose with seven petals is a symbol of transformative passion, inclusion, universal understanding, and order, which is likely rooted in Pythagorean numerology, where the number seven is iconic of the perfection in the specific unfolding of the universe and human understanding. So, if Garth Greenhand was in fact a god, as we are reasonably sure he was, it stands to reason that he would possess a deep understanding of the world and its creation knowledge that he would likely bestow on his children, such as Rose and Brandon, which perhaps gives a deeper meaning to the common saying, the North remembers. As previously mentioned, before Rose became Rose of Red Lake, she was Rose of Blue Lake, which brings us to Blue Roses, which have obvious symbolic ties to the Starks and have long been used in fictional works to represent the unattainable. Due to genetic limitations, blue roses cannot exist naturally, as they do not have the specific gene necessary to produce a color of true blue. In some cultures, blue roses are associated with royal blood, regal majesty, and splendor, while in others, the blue rose is analogized to the holy grail. Now, the blue winter rose is exclusively used in reference to the Starks. When Egret tells John the Bale the Bard story, she tells him that no flower is so rare nor precious, which explains why Lord Stark believed Bale wanted one as his payment. The only place the books reference blue roses growing is in the glass gardens of Winterfell, and if it's true that this is the only place they can be grown, then this seems to indicate that in George's world they too cannot exist naturally. Since it seems highly unlikely that the Starks are genetically engineering blue roses, this leads us to believe that there may be some sort of magic at play in the glass gardens, which causes or allows them to grow there. Now the winter rose is said to be a pale shade of blue, which brings us to House Crane's coat of arms. The sigil of House Crane is a V of seven golden cranes on a pale blue field. Here, the fact that there are seven of them takes us back to the seven-petaled rose, which represents transformative passion, i.e. shape-shifting, and the pale blue field seems likely to be representative of a field of pale blue roses. Wherever cranes exist in our world, their stature, intelligence, wariness, and social nature have captured the human imagination and given rise to a variety of legends, myths, and folktales. For instance, in Japanese legends, cranes were symbols of longevity, as they were thought to have lifespans of thousands of years. And when gods chose to descend to the earth, they often took the form of cranes, like Rose. Cranes are also said to have contributed several letters to the Greek alphabet, and are responsible for several words that have gained general use. The English word congruence, which means agreement, is derived from the Latin word for crane, grus. This got us to thinking of the legendary agreement that occurred in Rose's lifetime, the pact, and the very real possibility that she played a significant role in it coming to be. Based on Brandon of the Bloody Blade's legend, it seems relatively likely that he was either the leader of the First Men or one of them in their war with the children of the forest. If Rose was his baby mama like we believe she was, she would have had his ear and could have been the one that convinced him to make peace. After all, the world of ice and fire states that the wisest among the races met to form the pact, which to us means the leaders from both sides because they would be the only ones with the authority to actually make peace. At the time when this occurred, Garth's children ruled supreme over most of the First Men, 
with a few other houses like the Royces and Muds and perhaps even the Dustins. These would have been the quote-unquote wisest among the first men, who would have been present at the Isle of Faces striking a deal that created 4,000 years of friendship between the first men and the children. As a brief aside, that pretty much confirms that mankind and the children are no longer friends, and haven't been for between, I don't know, four and 6,000 years, otherwise known as since the Andals arrived. Okay, let's turn our attention to the man we are really here to talk about. Bran the Builder, the legendary founder of House Stark. As befitting a boy whose parents hailed from the Reach, Bran spent his formative years in the South, which is backed up by stories coming out of the Stormlands and Old Town, where legend tells us his earliest exploits as a builder took place. The legend surrounding the founder of House Durand and Durand God's Grief all comes to us through the singers. The songs tell us that Duran won the heart of Eleni, the daughter of the sea god and the goddess of the wind. By yielding to a mortal's love, Eleni doomed herself to a mortal's death. And for this, the gods who had given her birth hated the man she had taken for her lord husband. In their wrath, they sent howling winds and lashing rains to knock down every castle Duran dared to build until a young boy held him erect one so strong and cunningly made that it could defy their gales. The boy grew to be Brandon the Builder. Duran became the first Storm King. With Eleni at his side, he lived and reigned at Storm's End for a thousand years, or so the stories claim. That passage not only backs up the fact that Bran the Builder was in the South when he was young, but it also seems to be the only source of information as to how a god, or the offspring of two gods, becomes mortal. By yielding to a mortal's love, Eleni, the daughter of the sea god and the goddess of the wind, forfeited her immortality. As a goddess, becoming mortal still meant that she lived for another thousand years, which seems to make sense due to the fact that other mortal offspring of gods and humans are said to have lived similarly long periods of time. This passage also gives us a glimpse into how skilled a builder Brandon was, having built a structure that was able to withstand the wrath of Eleni's parents, gods who brought forth ceaseless winds and storms from the sea in such wrath that they easily shattered all of the other castles Duran built. While it is true that the gods do not forget, and the gales continue to rage up the narrow sea, storms end indoors, and has never fallen to storm or siege. Its great curtain wall is a hundred feet high, unbroken by arrow slit or postern, everywhere rounded, curving, smooth, its stones fit so cunningly together that nowhere can there be found a crevice, nor angle, nor gap by which the wind might enter, or a shadow for that matter. So what was so special about Bran that he was able to build such a formidable castle? Well, seeing as how Bran is descended from the legendary god of fertility, Garth Greenhand, through his parents, Rose of Red Lake, and Brandon of the Bloody Blade, this could mean that he too has some unique godly abilities of his own, which allowed him to weave magic into the structures he built, as is the case with Storm's End. In A Clash of Kings, Davos II, Davos is ordered by Stannis to sneak Melisandre beyond the curtain walls of Storm's End so that she may kill the Castellan using the shadow baby she made with Stannis. We find out later from Mel that the reason this needed to be done is because the walls of Storm's End have spells woven into them, spells that prohibit any shadow from passing through from the outside. The job young Bran did with Storm's End must have garnered him some positive word of mouth, because Uthor of the High Tower decided to hire Bran to design a new High Tower, one that would be made of stone, 
and worthy of being the seat of one of the realm's oldest and esteemed houses. It was only with the building of the fifth tower, the first to be made entirely of stone, that the high tower became a seat worthy of a great house. That tower, we are told, rose 200 feet above the harbor. Some say it was designed by Brandon the Builder, whilst others name his son another Brandon. The king who demanded it and paid for it is remembered as Uthor of the High Tower. We do realize that both of these passages refer to rumors or legends, but given that George has been quoted as saying that he had way more content than he could fit into the world of ice and fire, and he elected to use page space for these legends, we're going to go ahead and say that they're true. From here, we don't really get any information about Bran until after the Long Night, when he built Winterfell and the Wall, but it seems nearly impossible that he wasn't one of the heroes that led mankind to victory, as it seems highly unlikely that he, a southerner, could have founded the most powerful house in the north if he wasn't. We believe Bran the Builder was the legendary last hero of the north. As we've stated in a few of our previous videos, the histories according to the Maesters are often incorrect, as they tend to discount or flat-out ignore anything that disputes the teachings of the Light of the Seven. But as the World of Ice and Fire is one of three places we learn of the last hero with significant details, we'll begin with the official stance of the Citadel on the topic, and work the other information in as we go along. Maester Yandel states that when humanity was at its most desperate during the Long Night, the last heroes sought out the children of the forest in their secret cities with a group of companions, who all died by the time he finally reached them. The legend implies that whatever he learned from the children enabled the men who banded together to form the Night's Watch to win the battle for the dawn. Old Nan, whose word we pretty much take as gospel, tells Bran a story of the last hero, which corroborates the legend as recounted by Yandel, but goes further by telling us the last hero had a dog and that it was so cold that the last hero's blade snapped when he tried to use it. When Sam scours Castle Black's library, he finds accounts that state that the other's armor is impervious to ordinary blades, and their blades are so cold that they shatter steel on impact. This could be how the last hero from Old Nan's story broke his blade when he tried to use it. When recounting what he had found, Sam tells John that fire will dismay the others, and how they are also vulnerable to obsidian. Lastly, and most importantly, he tells them that he found an account of the Long Night that spoke of the last hero slaying the others with a blade of dragon steel. Immediately upon hearing this, John equivocates this to Valyrian steel, as the Valyrians were the ones who had dragons and possessed the ancient knowledge needed to forge Valyrian steel, which is said to have been lost in the doom. The issue with John calling it Valyrian steel, however, is that Valyria didn't exist yet, so it can't be Valyrian steel. But what if the people who came to be known as the Valyrians were once among the first men of Westeros, who, along with the last hero, learned the ancient magics of the Children of the Forest, which allowed them to forge the dragonsteel blade that was used in the account found by Sam. This seems possible given that the founding of Valyria occurred upwards of a thousand years after the Long Night, which, according to the Annals of the Far East, occurred as a result of the actions taken by the Bloodstone Emperor. According to this legend, it was only after the Bloodstone Emperor killed his sister, the Amethyst Empress, in order to usurp the crown, and the wickedness of men, that the Maiden Maid of Light turned her back on the world, ushering in an age of darkness, which we now know of as the Long Night. As some of you may know, we believe the Amethyst Empress had children of her own, children who eventually founded the Valyrian Freehold. So, if this is true, 
then during the roughly 1,000 years that lapses between the long night and the founding of Valyria, they had to have been somewhere else, right? Given that an unstated period of time lapses between the death of the Amethyst Empress and the long night, it's quite possible that the Valyrians first found shelter in Westeros and crossed the land bridge that once connected the two continents led there by none other than the legendary Garth Greenhand, all seeking to escape the Bloodstone Emperor and his gruesome rule. The same men who later fought and won the first battle for the Dawn, with the arcane arts and magic they learned from the children. Knowledge which they used to forge Valyrian steel, or dragon steel, blades and daggers, as well as dragon glass candles, which were used to communicate over vast distances, among other things. The children of the forest just so happened to be the foremost craftsmen of dragonglass, or what is referred to as obsidian by the maesters and frozen fire by the Valyrians, which supports the idea that it was they who taught the first men how to forge weapons that could kill the others such as the one used in the account found by Sam. This seems even more possible when you take into consideration the possibility that it was the children who created the others in the first place, as they would be the ones who know how to disarm the weapons of mass destruction they created against mankind. This is evident not only in the fact that they knew how to create weapons that would kill them, but that they used magic spells to protect the caves and caverns in which they dwelt, while the others were unleashed and wreaking havoc on mankind above. Additionally, it is said in the World of Ice and Fire that the Valyrians hungered for ore, which they found in the burning mountains of the Fourteen Flames, specifically copper and tin for the bronze of their weapons which are what the weapons used by the first men were made of. Lastly, in the World of Ice and Fire, there is one passage which mentions an Arc Maester Fomas and a text he authored called Lies of the Ancients that is pertinent to our discussion here. Archmaester Fomas's Lies of the Ancients, though little regarded these days for its erroneous claims regarding the founding of Valyria and certain lineal claims in the region Westerlands, does speculate that the Others of legend were nothing more than a tribe of first men, ancestors of the wild things that had established themselves in the far north. Because of the long night, these early wild things were pressured to begin a wave of conquest of the south. That they became monstrous in the tales told thereafter, according to Fomas, reflects the desire of the Night's Watch and the Starks to give themselves a more heroic identity, as saviors of mankind, and not merely beneficiaries of a struggle over dominion. So, why include this paragraph about the possibility that the Others never even existed, and that the Starks and the Night's Watch made the whole thing up, when every single person that reads The World of Ice and Fire has known for a fact since the prologue of Game of Thrones that the Others do exist. This is especially pertinent when considering that George ran out of room for everything that he wanted to include in the World of Ice and Fire, which is in part why the app exists. So why did he elect to include a completely useless paragraph? Well, the answer is because it isn't useless. But the part that's actually useful isn't the part that Yandel was considering, but the part that lost Fomus his credibility at the Citadel. The paragraph begins with Archmaester Fomus's Lies of the Ancients, though little regarded these days for its erroneous claims regarding the founding of Valyria and certain lineal claims in the region Westerlands. So based on the way that that sentence is put together, it seems like Fomus's treatise was virtually thrown out by the Citadel because he claimed that the Valyrians were in Westeros, and more specifically, in the Reach in the Westerlands before founding Valyria. So now the question becomes, how did they make dragon steel during the long night? That is something that's going to have to wait until next time. 
where we will be telling you our thoughts on ancient dragons being in Westeros, and why we believe Lady Forlorn's real name is Ice, and was the dragon steel blade used by the last hero in the first Battle for the Dawn. Also, be on the lookout for more episode reviews and our cameo appearance on Talking Thrones, where we will be giving our predictions on the fates of Jaime and Cersei in Season 7, as well as our own weekly reviews of the upcoming season, which will be out on the Monday following each episode. Don't worry, we will be back to our weekly videos related to the books, which will be out on Wednesday of each week. Picking up right where we left off here with part two on Bran the Builder. So until next time, stay tuned, like, and subscribe for more clarity on A Song of Ice and Fire, brought to you by the Order of the Green Hand.